So the next speaker and the next telepresentation is by Elena Prieto Rodriguez. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. I'm uh, not sure how you would like me to share my presentation with Skype, but you, do you have it there? Yeah. We, we don't have the presentation, so uh, I don't know, you'll have to just talk, I guess. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I suppose I, um, I can't do that. I did send it yesterday, but I'm not sure. Uh, but no, we, uh, Ram says he hasn't got the PDF, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, so I suppose I can just uh, talk and... Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, absolutely. No yeah. problem. Okay. So uh, the, um, sorry, the title sorry, the sorry. If you press on plus, you can share your screen. Then you can show it. If I press on, on plus. On. Yeah. Now see. we see your screen. My face. No, no. We see your. Is that? I can't share, there's I'm the, not entirely sure how. There's a big plus at the bottom. Next to the uh, red. Ah, yes. So I can share a screen. Let's see. Oh. I may be... Uh, Sharing, I'm not sure what, what it is that you see. Uh, yeah, we see it. <laughs> what do you see? Do you see we, we shall overcome? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. But, it, but uh, it, you, you should make it full uh, screen. Yeah. I will make it full screen. Yeah. If it lets me. Yep. All right. Okay. Really good. I've never done this. Oh, the wonders of technology. Well, this is all about exploration, so let's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, the talk uh, is, uh, is uh, called We Shall Overcome, and uh, it's about a small project that I've been conducting this year on social justice, social justice through mathematics education. So, um, let me see if I can, there we go. Yeah. So I assume you see a, a screen with a, a lot of text now. Yeah, 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 it's going fine. <laughs> well, so that text that appears there, um, I, I was trying to write a, a grant as we do, right? And uh, to, um, to try to find out why it was that um, young people in Australia, and as I understand it, across the world, are not studying mathematics. They, uh, in Australia, it's not compulsory to study calculus at all. So past year 10, which is when students are about 15 years of age, they stop studying mathematics. And I looked at all these reports that the different governments were um, sort of pushing out constantly and um, that's sort of a, a screenshot with a, a word cloud of what uh, those reports were saying. Uh, but the uh, important uh, thing here that gets quoted and quoted again and substitute Australia there with the United States or Germany or England and you will find the same thing, is that Australia's future is not one of vastly lower wage rates seeking to compete in low-end manufacturing. Our future lies in creating high technology, blah, 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 and being a very productive economy. So our students essentially, according to all these reports, should study mathematics to be highly productive in uh, a modern economy. And uh, my question here 
that I started pondering is, uh, is, is the economy the only or the main reason to try to achieve b better mathematics level in our society? And uh, this is sort of what led me to start reading and understanding what, it, what teaching mathematics for social justice is, um, is all about. And um, the, the reasons that are normally quoted in this report as to why children are not interested in mathematics are two. One is that uh, they've got perceptions of the careers that mathematics can take you into that are not accurate and uh, the other one is that um, they're just not interested in the way that mathematics are taught in, in school. And uh, <clears throat> these reports uh, quote sort of different influences as to why this may be the case. In terms of external influences, they talk about things like parental aspirations, gender, race, and um, if we look at the next slide here, there is um, a sort of a, this is from the PISA report in Australia, and uh, the on the vertical axis you've got uh, the quartiles in terms of socioeconomic status of students. So the top one is the lowest quartile and the bottom one is the highest quartile. So, so to speak, the poorest kids would be at the top column there represented and, and the ones with the richest incomes would be at the, at the bottom there in the highest quartile. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, good. So uh, what the other um, numbers indicate was the percentage of kids that attain different levels in each one of those quartiles. So um, a level six in mathematics is really good level of mathematics. And uh, level one or below level one is a very poor level of mathematics. So this is in the international uh, benchmarking PISA results. And what we can see quite clearly there is that the richer you are, the better you do at maths. Of course, uh, correlation, as we know, doesn't imply causation, but um, it, it is a fact that in Australia, and as I would assume all over the world, um, kids that come from higher income backgrounds end up taking those hard level mathematics courses and end up doing quite well in maths compared to uh, kids that don't have that amount of money. Um, then uh, th there was a, another range of influences that were quoted, like um, student self-perception of ability, um, the greater appeal of less demanding subjects, and uh, issues of motivation. So students were not interested and didn't find that mathematics was relevant to them. And um, this also was quite nicely distributed across, across social classes. So uh, students in higher social classes had a higher perception of their ability and, uh, and found it more relevant to what they could be, that they could aspire to be. Whereas uh, children from lower uh, socioeconomic classes or status um, would find this completely different. In fact, there is a a quote there from an article of, um, this is in the UK, and um, a study of 16 year olds um, and the reasons for not continuing to study mathematics. And that was uh, one that apparently was repeated. I would rather die than continue studying mathematics. So th this for, for me and for us, I suppose, is quite a shocking statement. Uh, considering how much we like it. And um, there is uh, been, you know, in all these reports, um, how do we change this, right? And they talk about the success in Shanghai, where uh, the focus was uh, going back to the basics in mathematics and having a ro lot of uh, rote learning and all that, as you know. And um, then, of course, there is all that talk about Finland and how they have moved away from standardized testing and uh, 
how the focus was on equity as opposed to achievement. And what they are achieving there is that uh, that graph of the lowest quartiles and the highest quartiles in terms of socioeconomic status is a lot less marked the difference than it is in other parts of the world. And uh, here is a quote, it's an Australian one, about um, how um, the, the mathematics can be used to explain and to change the world in terms of uh, opportunity for citizenship and the global economy, in terms of civil rights, equity, and uh, social justice. And um, so this brings me to, um, to my own research here that I did at a small community, sorry, small, at a large community school uh, in the Central Coast, which is a place that is between Sydney and Newcastle, which is where I am at the moment. So it's about a hundred and probably about a hundred kilometers north, north of Sydney. And uh, it is a, a rather large school and it's a, a very poor school in terms of the students that go there. And um, what they were finding is that none of their students wanted to study mathematics at all. So after age 15, they would just give up and never see any calculus, never see any geometry, never see really any ideas, big ideas in mathematics. So all they were taught <clears throat> were very basic statistics, um, some trigonometry and, you know, memorizing Pythagoras and sort of things like that. So um, these teachers, they just thought that perhaps if they showed something different to the students when they were young or younger, so uh, when they were about 12, perhaps they could change their view of what mathematics is. And, uh, and, and encourage them to continue with their study. And um, they wanted to do so by involving the children in projects that will see them as active learners. And they wanted also for children to see that um, what they had learned in the classroom really had a value and that you could use it to change the world. And just remember that we're talking about 12 year olds, so they haven't um, seen really all that much. But the teachers really felt strongly that uh, if they put the their knowledge of the kids to use, perhaps they would be enthused enough to want to continue studying mathematics. And uh, they created a series of uh, activities for the kids to do. The kids had to work in groups and the idea was in this case to explore uh, percentages and uh, by doing so instead of uh, just by learning how to use percentages using a sort of a very algorithmic and um, sort of rote learning was to understand what GST meant. Uh, so is the, the everybody is that the same word everywhere GST? No. No, it's uh, is the the percentage is a tax. Is a tax that um, oh, okay. um, that is uh, put on top of the articles when you buy something. Okay. So I think it's, it may be called VAT in yeah. some countries in Europe. Yeah. And it's just that twelve percent that you have to pay to the government every time you buy some goods. Okay. And uh, how that value is different if you're buying bread than it is if you're buying a car or if you're buying something else. And uh, the children had to explore this concept and prepare a presentation to show their parents about this concept. And um, they worked on it for about five weeks. Not all the mathematics lessons were used with that, it was just sort of once a week, they would work in a double period, which is about an hour and, and a bit. And um, what we, with the teachers, uh, we had um, some, uh, a project which was action research. So they wanted to know whether really 
this was changing the children's attitudes towards mathematics. So we surveyed them and with the teachers we um, decided on a set of questions that we wanted to know whether there was a change. And I'm not sure how big what you've got there is and if you can see it, but uh, there were things like, I think learning maths will help me in my daily life. I need mathematics to learn other school subjects. I need to do well in mathematics to get the job I want. I need to do well in mathematics to go into the university of my choice or into university. And I would like a job that uh, involves using mathematics. And what we found, and um, th this is the same questions after they had worked on this project, and I don't have the statistics here because, but I, I mean, I could run them, but essentially there was absolutely no difference before and after. Essentially, they found it equally as unimportant to their lives or as important. Um, they actually found that learning mathematics um, was important in their daily life, but they also found that prior to the activity. So that didn't change at all. Uh, but there was another question that the teachers were really quite interested in seeing, and uh, it was their relationship with the students. And the questions that um, they were um, most interested in were things like, my teacher thinks that I can do well with difficult material, and my teacher tells me that I am good at maths. And this is where um, you can sort of see it here a little bit, but the amount of agrees changed a lot. And yeah. uh, is that, that was a statistically significant with, you know, 0.000, 000 uh, in difference there between before and after. So the one thing that the teachers found that had changed was the relationship with the students and the willingness of the kids to want to do something just because they had built a relationship with a teacher that wasn't there before or not so strongly before starting this activity. So now they are um, really quite pumped to continue with this work. They want to take it further and they want to involve not just the teachers and the students and maybe the parents, but involve the community. And next year they are planning to do the same, but uh, with other matters. They actually want to explore transport in the area and how bad, badly it is designed and they want to take their results into the local member um, for, um, for the, that particular council area. Um, just to explain to him how people that don't have much money are being uh, discriminated because the transport uh, is not designed for them and it's really poor in the area and they want to do all this exploration using mathematics and um, so hopefully um, I will be able to report on this uh, next year uh, but uh, so far this is all I've got and uh, if you have any questions I'd love to to hear it. Thank you Elena. Couple of quick questions. Hi, hi, Elena. Uh, this is Hello. An hi, Anita here. Uh, I find this uh, presentation of yours really close to my heart. Very exciting. And um, we've also been working. My doctoral students have been working with children about the same age, 13, 14, and we actually find that even when we look at assessments differently. Our whole work was to see that uh, there, uh, the assessment patterns which are being adopted traditionally in schools and these children were failing and they couldn't understand many of the traditional ways of data handling. Uh, when we changed those patterns of assessment and started looking at the processes and how children on their own, because there was no teaching intervention, and we found a major change in the way, yes, as you said, their own identity as a maths learner the confidence that the teachers now have in them, but 
they went much beyond what was even ever expected by the school. And like what you say you're planning to do in transport, we've seen this in uh, projects like the midday meal, in th the children doing an entire survey of the changing child sex ratio amongst all the families of the school. And I, have, uh, I really look forward to hear more and I will contact you on email. I would yeah. love that, thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe if you could stop sharing, then we could also see your face at this point. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> let me see if I can do this. My face. Um, can you see me now? Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Quick. Come in. Okay, thank you very much. That was great having you all the way from Newcastle. Uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you so much for having me. Yeah, a big round of applause. Yeah. Now we go on to the next presentation. Bye. Okay, bye.